This morning we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through 15. And we're going to look at Paul's motivation. Paul's motivation was that of fear and love. Michael Jordan did not make his varsity basketball team as a sophomore in high school. Motivation has a powerful impact. For Michael Jordan, not making his varsity team motivated him to become arguably the greatest basketball player of all time. For the Christian, a proper motivation can drive us. It can drive us even as false accusations are made, even as we are criticized for going against the prevailing winds of culture, even as we may feel as though we are alone and abandoned. A proper motivation can drive our life. Today, we'll consider Paul's motivation, fear and love. If you'll open your Bibles, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 15. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your inspired word. Father, we thank you that as we open up the scriptures, they are the word of God. Father, we thank you that they are without error with you being the author. And Father, we thank you that they are sufficient for what we need. Father, I pray this morning that as we open up your word together, Father, that I would decrease. Father, that Jesus would increase. Father, I pray that you would speak to the heart of your church. Father, I pray that we would take these words and apply them to our lives. Father, I pray that as we consider the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, if there's one here today who does not believe that today would be the day they would cry out to you in faith, asking to be saved. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we have Paul's motivation. The first thing we'll see is that Paul was motivated by the terror or fear of the Lord. And that Paul was motivated by the love of Christ. Let us first consider Paul being motivated by the terror or fear of the Lord. Look back to your Bible, verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Paul had reminded the church in Corinth. Just one verse before, if you look to your Bible, verse number 10, the Bible says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The judgment seat of Christ is for the believer. It is not designed to separate the saved from the lost. It is instead designed to separate the works of gold, silver, and precious stones from the works of wood, hay, and straw. At the judgment seat of Christ, salvation is not at stake. What is at stake there is rewards. Paul knew that one day he would stand before the Lord and give an account for his life, how he lived, how he used the resources that God had given him. Paul knew he would stand before the Lord and answer for that. It was a motivating factor of Paul's life, knowing that he would stand before his Savior, the one the Bible tells us in Philippians, that God has highly exalted 
and given the name which is above every name. That motivation of knowing he would stand before the Lord motivated Paul to persuade others. Look to verse 11 again. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. To persuade means to convince someone of the accuracy as to what you are saying. Paul's desire was to persuade others of the truth of the gospel. And we'll see that in verse 21. Paul's desire was to persuade others of the judgment of God. We just saw that in verse 10. He wanted to persuade others that Christ's death was for all. He wanted to persuade others that they needed to be reconciled to God. And then as we'll see in verse 10, he wants to persuade others of his own integrity as he serves the Lord. Paul does all of this convinced that God knows who he is. God knows the motivation behind Paul's work and what Paul stands for. Paul does all of this convinced the church in Corinth knows who he is. They know what he stands for, the motivation behind what he does. But you see, there was a group in Corinth that was out to discredit Paul. They believed that if they could discredit the Apostle Paul, they could discredit the ministry. And so Paul turns his attention in verse 12 to make an appeal to the genuine believers there in Corinth, confident of who he was in Christ. Look to your Bible, verse 12. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you the opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. Paul had faced numerous attempts in his ministry and there in Corinth to undermine his character and his work. He reminds the church of his consistency of his words and his actions. He reminds the church of the content of his character. He reminds the church of the commitment that he had demonstrated to the Lord and to the church there in Corinth. Letting them know, if you look at this, if you look at my life, you will see a man who fears the Lord. It was not just an external show for Paul. It was the result of an inward conviction. Fearing the Lord, having that respect and reverence for the Lord. And he's reminding the church there in Corinth, he says, take what you have seen in me. Take how you have seen me live my life and that will give you the opportunity to boast against the accusations that are brought by those who boast in appearance and not in heart. Verse 13, Paul gives a defense for those questioning his methods and motivation. Look to your Bible. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. There were some who were opposed to Paul's ministry. There were some who were opposed to Paul. Because Paul went in such a counterculture way to the prevailing thought of the world, they thought he was out of his mind. And a lot of times when we do go against the culture, when we decide to follow Jesus and live for him, that may well be the response of others when we do that. But Paul reminds them, he says, however you view my ministry, if you think I'm out of my mind or I am operating with, it, with sound mind, let me remind you that I am fully devoted to God and to his church. I have demonstrated a commitment to our Lord and to you, and I am a man who is motivated by the fear of God. The Almighty God has my full attention. He has my full respect. There's a man by the name of Tom Askell, and he pastors a church down in southwest Florida. He has devoted his personal and professional life to one preaching with a conviction of the fear of God and one living in such a way to demonstrate 
that he has a fear of God. His passion is for the church to run away from the watered-down gospel that is being thrown out to them and to embrace the true gospel and watch Jesus revive his church. In December, he collapsed during a church service. He was rushed by ambulance uh, to the nearest hospital. He was in and out of consciousness as he made his way to the hospital. There were two EMTs there that were working on him. One was trying to get some sort of information out of his wallet. And the man began to curse and swear there in the ambulance. And Tom Askell, barely able to whisper, looked up at the man and reminded him. He said, fear God. Have a reverence for God. Respect the God who created you. A fear of God is necessary. It is exactly what the Scripture instructs us to have. The Bible says in Proverbs 1-7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. When you consider the life of the Apostle Paul, he was a man who was motivated by a fear of of the Lord. He was a man who was motivated by a terror of the Lord, knowing that his works would be exposed. A fear of the Lord is missing in our world. And as we say that in a church setting, a lot of times we'll see heads nod in agreement. Can I also go on to say that a fear of the Lord is missing in our churches? For the Christian young person, we see them choosing not to obey the instructions of their parents. We see the Christian young person unwilling to honor their father and mother as instructed by the Lord. They're secretly using apps that their parents have forbidden. They're having relationships that their parents have objected to. We ask the question, where is the fear of the Lord in that person's life? Reminded that one day they will stand before the Lord and give an account for their actions. The hidden apps and the secret relationships will not be unnoticed by our Lord. What about the fear of the Lord in the church when we think about the Christian husband? And as I preach through a book such as Ephesians, the nodding in agreement as we come to a text around the wife's submission to the husband, and then I begin to look down as we look to the husband's responsibility to love his wife as Christ loved the church. Then we find men immersed in pornography. And folks, don't think that's a worldly problem. That is a church problem. A 2014 Barna study said 54% of Christian men viewed pornography monthly. Where is the fear of the Lord in that man's life? Reminded that one day he will stand before God and give an account for his actions. The secret behavior will be revealed. What about the Christian mother? Her child desperately seeking her attention on the playground. Instead, we see her mindlessly scrolling through Facebook, looking at pictures of her cousin's neighbor's wedding while her child is crying out for attention. Where is the fear of the Lord in that woman's life? Reminded that she will give an account on the day of judgment. I read a secular book this week. I was so convicted after reading that book about the wasted time that was spent staring at a screen. I went and I deleted every single app that was not absolutely necessary off of my phone. I sat there, I, I told Stacy, I said, I've got to figure out a way to get away from this smartphone and go back to the phone I had when I was 18 years old that made phone calls and I could text. That's all I need. I don't need to be drawn into this mindlessness that I have been drawn into. I left there reading that book, thinking to myself about the wasted time 
on a screen, reminded that if I had 30 minutes left on this earth, Facebook would be the last thing from my mind. It'd be looking at my family, hearing their voices, spending time together. We need to have a fear of the Lord when it comes to how we use our time. Finally, the Christian senior adult. Perhaps you have retired from secular employment. Retirement from secular employment doesn't carry over to retirement from the ministry. We continue to minister until we have that last breath. So perhaps you're here this morning having retired from the secular world, but you've also retired from that daily devotion of reading your Bible. Your prayer life has slacked back. Can I just say to you, have a fear of the Lord, have a respect for the Lord, understanding you will stand before Him and He will remind each of us there were four quarters. We don't need to stop at the end of the third. Paul was motivated by the terror or the fear of the Lord. This was a man, his life was guided by a necessary and healthy respect for God. He was mindful that he would stand before the Lord one day and give an account for what he did or what he didn't do. We would do well as a church to be motivated by a terror or a fear of the Lord, having the healthy and necessary respect for the Lord aware that we will stand before him and give an account for our actions. Paul was motivated by the terror or the fear of the Lord. Next, Paul was motivated by the love of Christ. Look to your Bible, verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us. Now the New King James uses the word compels. The King James uses the word constraineth. This word that we see compels in the New King James has such a broad range of meaning. It's hard to pinpoint down exactly what it means. One commentator calls it controlled compulsion. Let me illustrate what it looks like to be compelled in the biblical sense. When Stacy and I were dating, we went to a seafood restaurant and she ordered fried shrimp. Now, as the fried shrimp came, she asked the server for ketchup. Now, I couldn't believe that somebody would ask for ketchup on fried shrimp. Growing up in South Florida, the only time ketchup got near shrimp is when it was mixed with horseradish sauce. But here she was, and she asked for ketchup, and I sat across the table contemplating, is this the woman I'm going to one day marry? As she sprayed ketchup all over the top of that fried shrimp. Now, that word compels. When you think about that word compels, I want you to think about that bottle of ketchup. As you squeeze the sides of it, it sprays out. The tip of that bottle of ketchup is what directs its path. So it lets you give it some force, and it points right where it is going. So as we look to what the Scripture says, I want you to realize Paul's life, was driven in such a forceful and direct manner. And we ask ourselves, well, what was it? What was it that compelled Paul to live in such a way? Look to your Bible. It's right there. The love of Christ compels us. Paul was on a single-handed mission to share the gospel with anybody and everybody, whether they listened or not. He was so committed to put away sin, to put it to death in his life, to live for the Lord. And his motivation, as we saw in the first few verses, was that respect for God. But now we see in the last two, it was the love of Christ. This is what drove Paul's life. Look to the rest of verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. Paul had come to the conclusion. For him, it happened on that road to Damascus 
as he met the risen Lord, he knew that Christ had left the glories of heaven. He knew that Christ had come to this earth, born of a virgin. He knew that Jesus had lived a sinless life and that he had died on the cross for Paul's sin, for my sin, for your sin, for the sin of the world. Paul knew that Jesus had done that. Paul knew that Jesus had risen from the dead. He knew that Jesus' substitutionary death in our place and his victorious resurrection did not save all people. I don't want us to look and mistake what that verse says. Just because Jesus died and rose again does not mean that every single person will be saved. What it means is every single person can be saved if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We must reject any religion that teaches that all will be saved one day. No, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection from the grave made salvation possible for all who believe. We think about those who believe. We think about the picture of baptism and what it represents. Those believing on the Lord Jesus Christ are buried with him in death. They are raised up in a newness of life. They then will live out the truth of verse 15. Look to your Bible. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Those who have experienced the love of Christ, they have a desire. They have a, motiva a motivation to live for Christ. The idea that thy will be done is the disposition of their life. Have thine own way, Lord, is the desire of their life. The world behind me, the cross before me, is the direction of their life. They're no longer motivated by a love for self. They're no longer motivated by a love for the things of this world. They are now motivated by the love of Christ. And I want us to think now for a moment. Think back 2,000 years ago. We see the holiness of God. We see the justness of God. And we see the love of God converge on a cross. God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who made the rules for this very earth. We see Adam and Eve. Yeah, they took a bite of the forbidden fruit, Genesis 3. God made a rule. They stepped across it. They broke God's rules. Each one of us have taken a bite in much the same way, breaking God's rules. That bite may have been when you coveted something that was not yours. Perhaps it was when you lied or you took something that did not belong to you. Maybe it was the act of adultery, whether physical or emotional, by way of lust. Maybe it was the act of murder, again, whether physical or whether it was being angry with another. Maybe it was when you dishonored your parents, you took that bite and broke God's rules. Maybe it was the indifference you had to the one day out of seven that God had set aside. Maybe it was when you took the Lord's name in vain by way of a swear word or by carelessly typing O, M, and then the seventh letter of the alphabet. Maybe it was the idolatry of your favorite sports team, your favorite television show, or even your family. Maybe it was when you put anything, and at times put everything, ahead of God and the rightful place He was to have in our lives. Whatever it may have been, God's holiness had been disregarded. 
God's holiness had been violated and a punishment when we break the rules established by the Creator was necessary. You see, the justness of God requires a punishment. God would not be just if He simply allowed a lying, murderous adulterer who profaned His name to walk away scot-free. The holiness of God was on display. The justness of God was on display. The love of God was on display. The love of God is what made it possible that we did not have to go to that cross. As Jesus went in our place, we said this morning, the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let me say clearly to each one here this morning, there is a God who created you. Each and every person has rebelled against him. That rebellion leads to separation, a separation that takes place now, and a separation that, if not corrected, means we'll be separated for eternity in a place called hell. God has made a provision for each one of us. The love of Christ made a way. The relationship, one's relationship with God can be restored as you admit that you have sinned against Him. As you believe that Jesus paid the price for your sin. Because the truth of the Scripture is this. Jesus, fully God, fully man, He came to this earth, born of a virgin. He lived the life we could not live. He died the death that we deserved to die. As he went to that cross 2,000 years ago, he died to atone for our sins. That means to satisfy God's judgment on sin. That is why he went there. He went to the tomb and he rose again. He's alive today. He has made it available to each one who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that they could be saved, they could be rescued from sin and restored to God. That is made available to all who believe. If you've not done so, I'd call on you, I'd encourage you today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Cry out to Him. Ask Him to forgive you of your sin. He will. Commit your life to Him this day forward. Paul was a man who was motivated by the love of Christ. For the rebellious Christian young person that's here today. Repent of your unwillingness to obey your parents, of your failure to honor them as God has said. Let the love of Jesus compel you to live for the one who died for you. For the adulterous man, repent of your lustful thoughts and your addiction to pornography. Let the love of Jesus compel you to live for the one who died for you. For the disengaged mom, repent of your mindless scrolling through Facebook. Let the love of Jesus compel you to live for the one who died for you. For the senior adult, on the sidelines, repent of your taking the fourth quarter off. Let the love of Jesus compel you to live for the one who died for you. Paul was motivated by a fear of the Lord. Paul had a reverential respect for God, knowing he would stand before him. Paul was also motivated by Christ's love. Both of those together provide an incredible motivation, knowing the God who created us died for us. Knowing the God who created us gave his life that we might live for him. If we're not careful, 
we can lose balance and we can disregard either side of that story. If we're not careful, we can lose our reverence for the Lord. If we're not careful, we can lose that reminder of how much He loves us. We can gather together and we can sing, I'm forgiven, yet failing to remember, I'm forgiven because Jesus was forsaken. We can sing together, I'm accepted, yet failing to remember, I'm accepted, Jesus was condemned. We can gather together and sing, I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, yet failing to remember. All of that is possible because Jesus died and rose again. When we consider, church, the greatness of God, the God of all creation who is due all of our utmost respect and reverence, let us motivate, let that motivate us to live for Him. When we consider the sacrifice, the love Jesus demonstrated as He went to the cross in our place, let that motivate us to live for the one who gave his life for us. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, for who you are. Almighty God, the creator of all that there is. Father, we come to you, Lord, reverent, Lord, with a, with a fear, Lord, a respect for you, Lord, knowing that at that moment, when we stand before you, Lord, we'll answer for what we've done. Father, for the believer, we won't answer for our salvation. Jesus has paid for that. We will answer for our actions. There'll be nothing to hide from. There'll be no way to lie. Lord, you know all and you see all. Father, help us to be reminded. Lord, you are worthy of all respect. Father, help us to be reminded of how great and how amazing your love for us is. Father, help us as a church to walk out these doors motivated with a resolve, Lord, to live for the one who gave his life for us. Father, if there's anyone here this morning that has never received the Lord Jesus, Lord, never been forgiven of their sins, let today be the day. Lord, they call out to you, ask to be forgiven, knowing and trusting that they will on the basis of Jesus' shed blood and his rising from the tomb. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.